Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm Sarah Kinghill and I work for the UK Data Service. Our main presenter today is going to be Emma Dickinson and she works as a Senior Research Officer at the ONS. Hi, thanks Sarah for the uh, introduction. Uh, this webinar is about the approach we've taken here at the Office for National Statistics, um, or ONS, to develop the household and sociodemographic aspects of our social surveys. Um, so within this talk, I'll use examples from the development mainly of the Labour Market Survey, but the principles, processes and designs have got a wider use, um, so should be able to be applied to any survey development. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the findings are specific to the UK context, um, but that's not to say they won't work or aren't worth um, experimenting with in international contexts as well. I've tried to pull out examples that I think are sort of universally applicable. So in this session, uh, so in the session I'll aim to cover three main areas. So I'll firstly talk about the context for this work, um, explain why it's important, and then talk about the approach and some tools that we've used to develop the questionnaires for sort of various modes. And then I'll provide some examples of our work from both the qualitative and quantitative tests which we've completed. So let's start with why. Well, if you listen to my colleague Natalia's webinar, which was last Thursday, you would have heard about our current drivers to transform our surveys. If you didn't catch Natalia's talk, it might be worth you listening into the recording if you want more details of this, because um, I'm just going to do a quick recap here to provide sort of the context for this talk specifically. So um, the government's got a digital by default strategy to move all services online by 2020. That includes everything like paying for your tax, getting a new passport, and it particularly applies to us and our online surveys. So that's underpinned by the Government Digital Service, or GDS, which provide principles, guidelines, and best practice for developing these services online. And I will talk about that quite a lot throughout this talk. So coinciding with this ONS and realistically across the industry, We've seen an expectation from our respondents to be able to complete our surveys online. And in addition to that, we've seen declining response rates here, so we need to look at ways to improve this. Because of these factors, ONS is currently undergoing a transformation program, which includes taking a push to web approach uh, to survey development. And that means encouraging respondents to complete in an online mode in the first instance before offering other modes such as interviewer led or paper complete. And all of that work basically leads the ONS to be able to produce better statistics and uh, ultimately leading to better decisions. So for a little bit more background, um, it's useful to know that our surveys are currently conducted either within a face-to-face -face interview in the respondent homes um, or on the telephone. Uh, as Natalia would have spoken about on Thursday, a letter is usually sent to the address ahead of the interview, but we rely heavily on the interviewers to sort of convert those who aren't overly enthusiastic or motivated, either to initially take part or to fully complete the survey. Our social surveys are also completely voluntary and usually involve minimal or no financial incentive for the respondent. So within any potential online mode, the interviewer is not there to convince people on the doorstep to take part um, or to help them complete the questionnaire. So we need to ensure our surveys are quick and easy for the respondent to complete, but also maintaining that accurate data to provide to our data users. There also needs to be a frictionless journey from the minute the envelope lands on the floor um, of the respondent's doorstep, as Natalia would have spoken about, right through to them finishing the last question and submitting their data, which is more what my talk will be on today. So there's a nice quote from GDS here, um, and it just highlights the fact that some respondents might know about the ONS or about your own organizations. They might be interested in surveys. Um, they might be able to recognize their importance. But by and large, they have absolutely no idea who we are um, and why they should help us. So we need to engage them. Uh, we need to make it easy for them. We need to develop a process and a survey which meets their needs um, as well as our own. So how do we do this? Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about our approach here at the Office for National Statistics, um, our methods and our design process as well. So most of our work involves transforming a survey that is currently running. Uh, so a first step for us is to review that questionnaire, that survey at desk. And even though we already have a version of the questionnaire, uh, which is gathering data, it's still really important to understand the business needs and their requirements. So for example, what are the required or desired outputs? Um, how does the data need to look? What's it used for? And by asking these types of questions, we can try and understand the, the concepts behind what we're aiming to measure, rather than simply gaining information about what data the questions are sort of currently collecting. 
So we also need to establish who the data users are. That can include other government departments, academic institutions, uh, individuals, charities, or even just members of the public, for example, or a combination of several different types of users. So we can also look at the format and the detail of the current survey. That involves considering the length and the complexity of the current questions and the response options. We also need to understand any definitions that are being used um, and if and how they are important to the survey and the data being collected. We also need to consider the current routing, how relevant that is to different types of respondents and the path they might follow throughout the questionnaire. Um, and when exploring interviewer-led questionnaires, we also need to explore the practical aspects that are used as well. So what does the interviewer do outside of the questionnaire? For example, do they use show cards or do they show respondents um, response options on a piece of paper to ensure confidentiality or, or any part of the question? And how can that be converted to sort of an appropriate online format? When reviewing the current questionnaire, it's a really good idea to get the experts involved. Um, at ONS, we have over 600 um, field staff, including telephone and on-the-ground interviewers, and they have a lot of knowledge which we can draw on. Those interviewers run and engage with our surveys on a daily basis, so they've got an excellent knowledge of how the questions are currently performing, um, what is working well with them, what isn't working so well, and for those questions deemed problematic, they can also inform us what they need to explain or what they need to clarify to the respondent, what guidance they provide and how they obtain the appropriate and correct answer. So during the initial stages of developing a questionnaire, we'll go out with the interviewers, um, we'll watch the survey and how it performs, we'll run focus groups and workshops with the interviewers to gain feedback, and that really allows us to begin exploring the respondents' mental models, which I'll explain in a moment. So if you work in an organisation with this kind of setup, um, then field staff are a really, really good starting point for that kind of work. And once you've understood the background needs and current issues with the survey, you can begin the redesign process. So at ONS, during the whole process, um, we adhere closely to 10 principles set out by the Government Digital Services. And you can find more about these on the GDS website, and I know Natalia went through some of these on her talk. Um, but for us social researchers and questionnaire designers, some of the most useful ones um, are start with user needs, and by that we mean the user in, being your respondent in this instance. Do the hard work to make it simple, and that is making it simple for the respondent. Iterate and iterate again, and be consistent, not uniform. And I'll demonstrate how we've used and met some of these principles throughout the rest of this webinar. So, for example, let's look at starting with user needs. Um, that means understanding your user, or your respondent, as I said, um, their needs in order to be able to provide the response as accurately as they can with minimum burden to themselves. So if you don't know who your users are, um, you won't build the right thing. They'll either become disengaged or they'll struggle to provide a response or they'll provide a response which doesn't match the data user need or simply they'll just drop off from the survey. So an optimal way to do this uh, is to consider their mental models. And this work can begin as you talk to interviewers, if, if you have them, um, understanding what the respondent needs the interviewer to clarify, what guidance they need, etc. That can all demonstrate to us how they understand the concept that we're presenting to them. So we need to explore how they expect to answer a question, um, what they need to be able to do this um, with minimal burden and mac maximum accuracy. We can also use focus groups to explore questions and concepts. That's a really good tool to gain discussion between respondents with either very similar or even very wide-ranging experiences. We've used them in ONS to explore concepts of nationality, national identity and ethnicity, for example, and you can gain a large amount of data in a short space of time. So once the exploratory work has been completed, um, and we know that both what the output requirement is and how respondents think of that concept, uh, we can begin designing or transforming our questions. And when doing this, we can make use of other experts. For example, we can look to other national statistic institutions and other survey organizations to see what they've done. So whether they've already developed surveys on similar concepts, and if so, what they look like. That also helps us to share learning and to make sure we can compare data where necessary going forward. At ONS, we also pay close attention to the usability and the accessibility of our surveys as well. 
and that means making sure that a wide variety of respondents can access them, whether they've got low digital skills, a physical impairment, English as a second language, for example. And some very simple considerations can actually make your survey more accessible and user-friendly, such as ensuring that the buttons that are appearing on screen, such as the Next or Save and Continue button, that that's actually big enough to be seen and it's big enough an area to be clicked on. Others sort of require more investment, such as making sure our designs and our software are compatible with assistive technologies um, and can be used alongside um, screen readers, for example. Guidelines are available on um, available on that from sort of organisations such as GDS, and there's a link to that web page at the end of my talk. We also look within the team and to other professionals in the survey and questionnaire design community to ensure we're using best practices. Um, so within ONS, we've developed several design principles as well. So for example, we ensure that any design of online survey works on all devices. We usually begin the design process by starting with a mobile screen here. Uh, that challenges us to design well, because um, we've got to be really conscious about the space that we've got available to fill, and that constrains aspects such as your um, length of question stem, um, the number of response options we have, for example. And then using progressive enhancement, we can ensure that as the screens get bigger, so through tablets, laptops, PC screens, etc., that the design continues to work optimally. We also optimize for the mode. Um, we begin with the online version and then adapt this when necessary for interviewer-led modes. Um, that might mean, for example, that two questions from the online mode might actually become one in a face-to-face -face interview, since all the information is gathered sort of more conversationally by an interviewer. And I'll show you an example of that later on. We also design without guidance or help initially, and only put it in where testing deems it absolutely necessary. We know um, a simple fact that respondents very re rarely read or use guidance um, and help that's made available to them. Um, and with complex concepts, we find it's better to break the question down into simpler aspects, even if that involves several questions, rather than to force the respondent to read the guidance text and comprehend it enough to provide the correct response. So essentially, not relying on guidance actually forces us to design better in the first place. We also use the respondent's language, so typically government-based communications and services have adopted a very professional tone, um, using the Queen's English, expecting the respondent to adhere to sort of strict organisation-defined definitions, for example. Uh, however, that means that many respondents just simply turn off from our surveys, um, or they, they can't understand what we're going on about, essentially. So by using their language, um, or by recycling language that interviewers are using, we can speak more conversationally, we can engage people, and we can also, by using language, um, increase their own relevance and understanding of, of what we're talking about. And we've got mental models, uh, which I explained earlier, and also designing with data. Uh, so that relates to the flow through the questionnaire, um, ensuring that's relevant and optimal for our respondents. On a very basic level, that involves dealing with the majority of our respondents first, um, getting them through and out of the survey as sort of timely as possible. Um, and routing the more obscure situations out later. Um, and just basically ensuring that respondents only see, see questions that are relevant to them. As part of this, um, we check all of our wording through readability tools like Hemingway.com. Um, that allows you to sort of sense check as to where your sentences might be falling down and help you identify to make improvements. Here at ONS, we aim for a reading age of nine years old because that's the average reading age of the UK population. The tool and this process of um, readability scoring, it's not perfect, of course. Um, some of the words which will come out as being considered as complex are necessary within the questionnaire. So, for example, if um, well, the word nationality can't really be substituted for anything else if the question you're asking is about respondents' nationality. But the tool does allow you to consider your wording and where it may be sort of unnecessarily complex or long, for example. So after designing the questionnaire, um, we need to test it with our respondents in a qualitative setting. At ONS, we use both cognitive interviewing and usability testing. Um, with online testing, we actually use both techniques concurrently rather than sequentially. So what that means in practice um, is we start by building a prototype of our survey um, or of the questionnaire that we want to test, and we actually build the entire end-to-end -end questionnaire, even if we're actually only interested in a few of the questions specifically. 
and that's to ensure we're providing the full context to the respondent. So it's sometimes difficult to disentangle the effects of one question from another. So for example, in our previous testing, um, we actually found that respondents responded differently to a nationality question, depending on whether it was placed before or after a question on national identity. So by testing questions um, on their own, you'd actually miss that interaction completely. So within a testing session, um, we allow the respondents to access the prototype on their own device as well, um, whether that's a mobile or a tablet or a laptop, for example. And that's to ensure that any effect of using an unfamiliar device is reduced. We ask them to use the Think Aloud process whilst they're filling out the online form, um, note any observational cues such as facial expressions, which can be really enlightening, um, body language, and also how they're sort of interacting physically with the tool that they're using, the prototype. Um, and then we go back afterwards and retrospectively probe on areas of interest and how they've understood certain questions and what they mean in their own words and that kind of thing. So running both cognitive and usability sessions concurrently, particularly for an online mode, um, it allows us to establish how the tools affected the respondent's comprehension of um, and reaction to the question as well as how the question and response wording has affected how they use the tool. And I'll mention that later when I give you an example, some interesting findings there. So once the testing round's been complete, we then transcribe it, um, we thematically analyze, uh, iterate designs, and test, test again. So I'm now going to show you a few examples of the things we've tested and how we've brought the principles into um, doing that. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges for us here is that most of our surveys are at household level. So we need to collect details about all of the household members, um, not just one individual specifically. So the Labour Force survey is a really good example of this. You can see here on screen the interviewer version of the very first question which is asked. And that asks the interviewer to record the number of people who live at the household. And the way in which people are included um, or excluded as part of the household is actually quite complex, according to ONS rules. There are several pages of guidance on this that the interviewers have to understand. But the process, it generally works quite well in an interviewer mode. Um, like I say, the interviewers um, understand that guidance and they have training on it. Um, and it's all just very conversational for the respondent. The tool then generates the amount of fields necessary for each person and then the interview just collects their names, collects their sex, um, date of birth, etc. And then they go on to collect the relationships between all of the household members. And like I say, it's just really conversational. Um, the interviewer might ask the questions or they might simply record the information that's already been given to them within that conversation. The problem is if you try to put this into an online mode in exactly the same format, this is what you end up with. So bear in mind, this is pretty much the first page which the respondents would see. Um, they're faced with a wall of text, um, and they're asked to read all of this information and then calculate how many people are in their household based on our ONS definitions. So even if our respondents are diligent enough to read this, even if they digest it and they understand it, adhering to it is actually pretty difficult for them. That leads to respondent burden, bad data quality, or we just see them dropping off at this page on the questionnaire. And this is where this no guidance principle is referred to and it's used. Um, in addition, this might be what our data users want, but it's not starting with our respondent user needs. So it asks the user to perform a calculation, which isn't really something that they do in everyday life or think about. It also doesn't meet their expectations of their mental models. So if you think of any online form or service you interact with, so whether that's Amazon, a comparison website, or even if you just go and do some shopping online, one of the first things you expect to have to do is put your details in, at least your name. So we needed to match that expectation. So the first thing we did um, was just strip it all back, simplify the design. Um, the first step would therefore be asking for the details of everyone in the household, uh, regardless of our definitions. And then we designed these follow-up questions where we could weed out the people we actually didn't want. Um, we thought that would be a lot easier to digest um, and would put the hard work on us rather than the respondent. But actually, it was a bit of a fail. Um, respondents got quite lost. If they weren't sure whether to put somebody in as living the, the address, um, the classic example being somebody who was living there but currently away from the address for a period of time, they often didn't put them in at the first question. They then got to the second page and realized they should have put them in, and then it meant they got lost trying to either go back and add somebody in, 
or they just simply didn't put them in at all, which obviously is compromising our data. So that's a prime example of where we've stripped it completely back to realize we actually need to put some guidance or some detail back in. So we added some guidance to hopefully assist the respondent. And from what we knew about guidance, as I said earlier, we knew it wouldn't always be read by everyone. But we thought that by making it obvious, using it a blue box around it, um, and seeing how it was such an important question, or at least to us, that would encourage respondents to read it if needed. Um, and as expected, respondents who had straightforward situations, they didn't read the guidance. But interestingly, those who needed the guidance, and some of which they actively told us they were looking for guidance, um, they didn't use it. Either they didn't spot it or they didn't use it. And that led to them querying why they had to put everyone in here, or they totally missed that they had to put everyone in here. So we considered that a fail as well. One of my favorite quotes from testing um, was actually from a gentleman who lived with his wife and his children. And he pointed at the add another person button and he said, well, I've just put myself in. I don't know what this add another person button is for, so I'll just ignore it. And that's a classic example of how important it is to integrate both cognitive and usability techniques. Um, a test that involved just cognitive interviewing might have led to the conclusion that the wording of the question stem wasn't clear enough, uh, whereas a usability test might have concluded that the add another person button function wasn't clear enough. Actually, when we um, probed on this, we found that the issue was that the respondent was drawn first and foremost to the fields they needed to complete it. So to their title, first name, given name. And he went ahead and completed them without actually reading anything above that text. So we needed to remodel the process again. So we asked respondents now to put themselves in first um, before thinking about anything else. And this worked really well. The design met the respondents' expectations um, and needs because it's straightforward and it's familiar. The respondent essentially expects to enter their name and details in as the very first thing that they do. And it's the most basic information that we ask for, right? It's your name. So it therefore leads the respondent in. Um, it instills confidence that the entire questionnaire will be easy and straightforward. That's not saying it is, but that's the impression they get, which is great. We then need to establish whether there is anyone else in the household. Note here that the language we're using is as simple as possible, which is entirely purposeful and relates to using language which the respondent uses. We don't talk about households, we talk about living at and addresses. And we put the address in the question stem where we can, just to reiterate the address we're talking about. So in the majority, people are now flying through this with confidence and accuracy. Um, and for those who may be unsure about whether to include certain people, we added minimal guidance into the response option. That was quite a new technique for us at the time. Um, guidance, uh, but what, what we realized really is that guidance under the question stem um, is often overlooked because as humans, we associate it with being sort of this inconsequential blurb that I'm just gonna sort of skip over. And in contrast, when the guidance is in the response option, it suggests that whatever is written there directly relates to the question with that response, and it's more often attended to by our respondents. We then um, play all of this back to the respondent and give them an opportunity to add in anyone they may have forgotten. And only then do we introduce other types of addresses, and it's there between this page and another one later on that we ensure the correct inclusion and exclusion criteria is actually adhered to. So to the respondent, this just feels like standard questions, but they're actually crucial in obtaining the data quality which we need. So you can see here what we've actually done is we've broken the first question down into a series of sort of smaller and easier questions, and ultimately we're doing that hard work so the respondent doesn't have to. In terms of establishing the relationships between householders, we've also employed mental models here and using the respondent's own language. So in the online mode, we've iterated several designs for this question. Um, initially, we followed the interviewer mode process, which involves stating um, Donald Duck is Daffy Duck's ex, for example. I always use the Donald Duck family. Um, but the respondent became really confused with this. Um, at the least, the process caused them significant co cognitive effort. Um, and at the worst, the respondent actually would code the relationship the wrong way around. So they would say that Donald Duck is Daffy Duck's wife rather than husband, for example, which is obviously not great for our data quality. And through testing, we came to understand, understand that respondents think of their own relationships quite possessively. Um, in conversation, we often say that so-and-so is my husband or my sister or my mother. Um, and we wanted to create a design that followed that sort of mental model of how we talk about people. 
So we added the relationship aspect into the page where respondents add all the other household members. And that actually suits the way in which people think about their relationships. Actually, as we were watching and listening to people through testing, what we would hear is the respondents say, OK, so this is my mother, sister, etc." before they'd even clicked on the drop-down asking for the response option. We've also made the response options for this sex biased, um, that sex bias, not specific. That helps um, reduce respondent burden. So for the respondent, um, before they even look at the list of response options, they generally have a word in their minds that they're looking for, whether that's mother, father, whatever. And a normal reading pattern would see them scanning the left-hand side of that list. So therefore, if they're looking for wife um, and the response option reads husband or wife, what happens is they initially see the husband bit, um, but they skip over the wife part, which becomes kind of lost in the list. So by having wife or husband first uh, for a female individual, it reduces that cognitive processing. So that's how we develop the online mode um, for that section, but what about other modes? Once the online mode was optimal for respondents, we took it back to our interviewers, ran another workshop, and we were aware that there might be some aspects that would work well for them and some which might not be optimal because of the different contexts, challenges and practicalities which each mode brings. So we showed the uh, online mode to the interviewers and sought their feedback. Now the telephone mode, for example, is a different context to online. Um, technically, the interviewers should stick quite strictly to the script we're giving them um, to ensure that the respondent's answer is not biased or changed by alternative phrasing, for example. Um, but the online version was unnecessarily burdensome for both the respondent and interviewers in the telephone mode um, because answers to questions were quite often provided as part of the conversation at previous questions. So therefore, fewer questions actually needed to be asked. So you can see the first question of the telephone mode here, which is pretty much the same as the online version. Um, however, the following pages are different. So interviewers stressed that the counting of individuals was very useful to them and that worked better than collecting details up front um, in the telephone mode. So providing an in, by providing an initial count, um, interviewers could be provided with according rows in their software so they could then fill them in with names and details and they could all then just play that back to respondents. And through conversation, the interviewers were sort of confident and capable of correctly including and excluding householders from the count um, based on the circumstances. But to ensure data quality, we then included this as part of the check question at that second question there. So we refined the method over a number of iterated designs and testing rounds. Um, during testing, we adopted a real-life scenario as possible. So what we would do is we'd actually sit with the respondent in their own home whilst the interviewer rang in and completed the interview with them remotely. So we were able to hear what both parties were saying and that allowed us to establish whether the interviewer felt they needed to go off script or provide clarification um, sort of to the respondent uh, to get the correct information. But we could also watch the respondent for body language and facial cues. And then subsequent to that, we would undertake cognitive interviewing with the respondent and later sort of a group debrief with the interviewers to gain their feedback and their perspective. So essentially, although the questions and the flow are different between the online and the telephone, they consistently collect the same data. That's also true of the face-to-face -face survey, which is different again. Uh, and in this mode, the household composition is often discussed right on the doorstep. It's very conversational. The respondent usually opens the door and asks the interviewer, OK, how long is this going to take? And the interviewer explains then that it depends on the situation of the household. So by the time the interviewer has actually got in the house, they generally have a good idea of who lives there. And to repeat those questions would be really burdensome for both parties. However, the interviewers did tell us they required sort of clarification over the include and exclude rules in some such situations. So we're remembering here that interviewers are our users too. They have to use the product. So we needed to design something they could sort of quickly and easily use on the doorstep to um, correctly allocate people or exclude them. And this A5 leaflet, this is actually would be back to back, so you're seeing both sides of it here. That was produced after sort of various iterations and feedback rounds with interviewers. So interviewers can then simply enter the correct number of people as the first task, um, which they've done before they've even entered the address, and then when they're in there, collect the names and details. And very few further questions are then necessary due to the sort of conversational probing that's already occurred. So this flow um, process has been now tested quantitatively, uh, firstly in the online mode, and then with an online and mixed mode test. And what we see is actually very encouraging. 
So our quantitative test to date have shown that the drop-off through the household section is low. Our large test in 2017 showed that it was only 0.8% of respondents accessing the survey but not completing the household grid. Um, that was a similar uh, figure in 2018 in another test. And in this year's test, that was actually 0.4%. We've made some small improvements. In addition, our respondents are coming back, which is fantastic. So in 2017, we ran a Wave 2 test from the original sample. So it's a little over 5,000 respondents who completed at Wave 1 were invited to come back and do a Wave 2. Um, bear in mind that the Wave 2 did not display any, re-display, sorry, any of the data collected at Wave 1. It was a completely blank questionnaire, which was exactly the same as the one they completed a few months before. And actually, 60% of respondents completed that, with only 0.7% of respondents who accessed the survey dropping out before completing the household grid. And what those results are showing us is that we aren't seeing drop-off where we would traditionally expect it, which leads us to be confident that the design is working. So I'd just like to touch now um, quickly on some other questions from the Social Demographic section and show you how we've used the principles um, that I've discussed so far to develop those. So firstly, uh, the date of birth question. Uh, this used to be up front in the household grid, um, but we found issues with it there in that location. In our quant tests, we actually saw drop off and we saw attempts at skipping without providing an answer. And the question is actually very important to us. Not only is it a piece of data we would really like to use in outputs, but more than that, it's really important for our routing. So we need to know if the respondent is at least over or under 16 years old, so that we know what questions to ask them later in the questionnaire. So we investigated this through qualitative research, and we found two reasons for the missing data and drop-off issue. Either respondents felt it was very sensitive information and they were unwilling to provide it, or it was because they were asked to provide it on behalf of another housemate, and they simply didn't know the answer, particularly if they weren't related. Although you'd be surprised at how many uh, parents don't know the uh, age or date of birth of their husbands or wives or children, for example. So we changed the design in two ways. Uh, firstly, we moved the questionnaire to the individual section. That's because fewer individuals would then see it as a proxy question. And a slightly more hidden advantage is that because the respondent has already come through several questions, they were more comfortable in the flow of the questionnaire. They were somewhat committed to finishing it. And then it meant that sort of this potentially sensitive question seemed almost less sensitive to the respondents in this location compared to whether it was the second ever question they saw. The second change was to make the date of birth skippable. So obviously we would prefer it if they did provide an answer, um, but not at the risk of losing them completely at this stage if they're not comfortable in doing so. So, But we still needed to know whether they're over 16 or not for their routing, so simply we ask them what their age is. That provides us with the data that we need, but it also fits the user need as well uh, to perfect their, protect their information which they deem as sensitive. So in the interviewer mode, um, we're actually also trialling some wording to hopefully allay the respondent's concern before we get to the age question. And that would involve reminding the respondent that the data they're providing is confidential and that date of birth is important to enable us to gain sort of an accurate picture of the population. We've yet to trial that quantitatively though, so it'll be interesting to see if that works. So we also have the country of birth question. You can see the interviewer mode here. And interestingly, that interviewer mode contains guidance which suggests that the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands are not part of the UK and should be coded under the other field. Now, when developing this for an online mode, uh, we adhered to our principle of not using help and guidance um, unless absolutely deemed necessary. But we wanted to make this easier for interviewers as well. As I said, they are our users. So we simply added that guidance as a specific response option, and that's working really well. Lastly, I wanted to discuss the ethnic group question because that's been a top, hot topic sort of both inside and outside of ONS recently. You can see the interviewer mode here. The interviewer asks this sort of high-level question and depending on the answer, they will ask a follow-up question to gain more detail. In the early days, so that was back in oh, 2015, um, we replaced this pattern, uh, sorry, replicated the pattern for the online mode, which looked a bit like this. And through that testing, we found that respondents really like to see all of the available sort of sub options up front to assist them to choose the most appropriate. However, what we saw, which is really interesting, was that respondents, whether they wanted to or they thought they had to, were choosing one response from the white category, one response from the mixed multiple ethnic group category, one from the Asian category, and so on. And that obviously didn't meet our 
data quality need. It also cancelled out the one they chose previously, which is not fantastic. So several iterations later, and here's the latest design. It's still a work in progress at this point, um, particularly with regard to some of the sub-wording that we're using, but it's generally working really well for us. It meets the user need because it allows them to see all the available options up front while still being quite easy to digest and to understand. So what's next? Well, we're currently pleased with the design. Um, we believe it to be working optimally for all of those that I've talked about. But user-centered design continues to be iterative, and it's really important that we regularly explore the sort of efficiency and suitability of designs going forward. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and to end this webinar, much like with Natalia's, I thought it'd be useful to provide some sort of top overarching tips. So they are um, to identify your users, that is your data user initially, who's going to use the data and what for, but also and potentially more importantly, who are your respondent users? Who's going to be filling in the survey? What do they need to be able to complete it accurately, confidently, with minimal burden? Also use the expert knowledge that's already out there in the field and community. Uh, visit the GDS website, for example. They've got really good information on principles um, and common question designs. Try and recycle others' good research where possible, especially if you have a constrained budget and can't do it all yourself. Um, develop standards based on what you read and what you find through your own testing, and think thoroughly before you step away from those. Get out and test as much as, as possible. If you have a healthy budget, um, as ONS are lucky to have at the moment, use focus groups and one-to-ones where possible. But if your budget's smaller, there's always something that you can do. So check out um, pop-up testing or guerrilla testing, for example, where you can still make big wins um, on a relatively small amount of money. So test constantly as well where possible. That means designing your questions in smaller chunks, tackle a few questions at a time, and that will allow you to achieve sort of big wins. Um, it also means you know that part of the survey works before moving on to the next chunk. And keep reiterate, reiterating even when the survey's finished. Make sure it continues to work. So I've put some useful sort of sources here which you can check out after we're done. 